right, good evening. Wait, wait, wait. Welcome wow. everyone to the Thursday, March 21st, 2024 planning board meeting. If we could all raise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Introduction to board members. To my far left, we have Don Ganarelli, Paul, uh, Jerry Graybill, Paul Amatucci, myself, Michael LaRue, Bill Roy, Rick Raines, and Les Bodwell. We also have Irish Griffith, the code enforcement officer, and Hannah Watson from SMPDC. All right, there is no public hearings. I will open up the first public comment. This is for non-agenda items. Seeing no one come up, I'll close that. Next is approval of minutes for March 7th, 2024. I've read the minutes and uh, and think they should be approved as written. I'll second that. Okay, further discussion? All in favor? I will abstain as I was not present. Okay. <coughs> So everybody voted yes. I was looking down writing. Uh, except for you. Except for you. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I should have clarified that. All right. So moving on. Old business. Stop and go Berwick. 355 Portland Street. Conditional use. R70. Lot 12. Zone RCI. This is the board administration. Good evening. Wyatt Page, Adder Engineering, representing Kevin Patel. And Mr. Patel is with me tonight, as well as his attorney, Brian Barrington. We have a small amount of updates for you folks, as well as our updated plans. Um, a little bit later on. Um, you got to speak in the mic just so the people. Yes. Okay. So, in addition, you can bring that to you. Yeah. Oh, perfect. I can do that. So, just to walk everyone through the project again, since it's been a little while since we were last before you, we have Portland Street Stop and Go, and a few notable changes um, that came up. We. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Um, the layout of the actual building itself has been fully updated along with Winter Holbin's new plan set. We have a rendering that'll show you in a minute showing the front of the building. I know previously there were some objections about the appearance. We've updated that. We have an example of the signage that's going on the front of the building. We have expanded the width of the driveway after consulting with Maine DOT. So we now have a 16 foot wide entrance lane as well as two 11 foot wide exit lanes and a shoulder as well. Um, this is obviously to accommodate, we had, I know there had been some discussion of larger trucks as well. Uh, I believe, I can't remember which of you it was that had requested it, but I believe we had been asked to provide at least some indication of what a WB67 semi-trailer would look like if it were to try to enter this property. And I will be very upfront, the way that it looked entering definitely influenced us to widen this. I, as well to where it is now. And we have a vehicle tracking sheet that we'll get to in a moment, but um, additionally now we are showing electric vehicle chargers for these four spaces over here next to the dumpster pad. And I believe that's most of the site plan changes themselves. And just as a reminder for anyone, this is, so the actual site is presently undeveloped. This is just a small swath of wetland in the back that we are not touching with any of our developments. Kind Farms is over here, Route 4 down on front. And there is an existing gravel drive curb cut that is present right on Route 4 that will actually be cleared out. This is because the main, we initially wanted to put our driveway over this curb cut. Main DOT had some objections specifically related to improvements down on Blackberry Hill Road, which is just off the page here. You can see the actual road sort of running down the corner. Um, 
uh, but mostly an undeveloped site. We've already had our site walk. Things were flagged out there, and I believe they still are. I can't speak for the condition of those flags, but if you want a refresher on what things look like, I encourage you to go back out there. The only thing that wouldn't be accurate with those flags is the exact corners of the building may have shifted just slightly as we have changed the actual floor plan of the building. One moment. Grading and utility plan remains unchanged from the previous iteration, other than a small, small shift in the rear of the building that created a little bit more of a green space buffer between the building and allowed for. Go ahead, grab the mic. Sorry. It's just right. so the people online can hear you. The, of course, yeah, sorry. The only updates to our grading plan was a very slight shift in the grading in the rear of the building to create a little bit more green space as well as accommodate those larger trucks, which I know someone had raised concerns for at the prior meeting. We have some stormwater sheets. One moment while I put some of these down. Don't remember talking about moving the mic. Previously, there had been some questions about a lighting plan. We now have a fully updated lighting plan with that it has, in fact, been modified for the new layout of the building. Um, please take note, at all borders of the property, we are at zero lumens everywhere. On no point leaving the property will there be any lighting of any sort overflowing into other properties. And I do also want to point out, because it will come up later, we did submit a signage package and we did request a waiver for one section of the signage ordinance related to being able to have a lit display for the gas station price readouts. We'll get to that later. That is currently not shown on this lumens plan, but it would be a very small pocket here. And still we have spoken to our lighting, our lighting people. Whatever we come up with for a lighting sign, should you decide to grant the waiver, we'll still meet, meet with the philosophy of zero lumens at all borders. This guy. <sighs> Vehicle tracking. There was a pretty reasonable amount of concern over what exactly it would look like pathing various different types of vehicles into the building. We have our design size, which is a WB40 intermediate semi-trailer. When I say design size, I mean this is the size that Mr. Patel has quoted would be regularly servicing this gas station and regularly services his other locations as well, namely the Elliott location. Um, you can see it does just fine. Getting in only barely overflows out of the main entrance lane. It can get around the building, pull over to potentially fill up the tanks underground. If it were a delivery vehicle, although I don't know why we would have a delivery vehicle for food or produce of that size, it can also fully circumnavigate the site. Things start to get a little more complicated when you look at WB67s. These are the larger semi-trailers we were asked about before. I can't remember the exact trailer length, but I checked it against my notes. I want to say it was like 53-foot trailer or something like that. You're nodding. I believe that's the number. Yeah. WB67s previously on our prior layout could not really navigate the site. With our modified driveway, they now can. WB67 trailer coming from up Route 4 in the direction of Kind Farms going toward downtown is now able to make it over with only the actual trailer itself going off the pavement. Not the, not the wheels, mind you, but the overhanging portion of the trailer. It's able to fully circumnavigate without making contact or getting too close to the, um, the gas canopy. It can make it around the building. And similarly, just as before, it can get itself theoretically in one motion without stopping all the way over to service these gas stations if we had a larger truck that needed to make a fuel delivery. Getting out would require some stopping or turning. It cannot make a full circuit around and out in one continuous motion. There would need to be some stopping and turning. That's pretty, that's pretty normal. Um, exit path, once it's aligned out rear, it is able to make one singular motion from the rear of the building all the way out provided it's not turning elsewhere to fill up any gas tanks or anything like that. So I want to be clear, a 53-foot trailer truck, or a WB67 as it's referred to, can navigate the site. It's not ideal. We've done our best to accommodate it, and I don't 
think we would prefer to make any further adjustments to make it easier. It's we've already done a lot, and we're pretty we're pretty limited without tripping into the next le level of uh, of DEP approval as far as stormwater design goes. And we'd like to. We've already proposed a lot of impervious surface. I don't really think we want to make more for a truck that we don't even anticipate coming to our property at all. And that's all of the updates to the adder plans, the site plans. We have some small updates to Winter Holbin's plans as well. Um, I believe the layout of everything inside is more or less the same. The layout of the building has been modified a little bit as far as like some of these little overhangs and various uh, there's some windows shown as well. I have a rendering that will look a, a lot clearer in a moment. This is just basic layout. This should be included in the submission packet as well. All right. I apologize for the grayscale, but this is what the front. Of, this is what our building is going to look like now. It is definitely not what the original design appeared to be. We listened to some of the complaints and concerns about the building's appearance and have made the proper <coughs> modifications. Um, I had also had a handful of questions from Terry, Terry Wilson of the town of Berwick. She had some specific questions regarding materials. I'm just going to grab that super quick in case anyone was looking for it. Where, where? I'm not seeing the actual printout. I can grab that on the phone if we wanted to read it out. But essentially, um, much of the, if it looks like wood on the front, it's wood. Um, there are some sections that appear to be stone, ne namely the columns on the, the bottom of the columns for the gas canopy and the very bottom portion of the building. Terry had inquired about that. Those are not, in fact, stone. Those will be concrete or some sort of, some sort of concrete uh, foundation with maybe like a decorative coating over it. I don't know exactly, but you can stamp them usually. Yeah. yeah, something to that effect. I believe is what we're looking at. We also now have some mock-ups for the sign on that would be on the building. <sighs> we have two mock-ups. We have this whole big signable area here. It's a little hard to see at this distance um, without color, but tracing this section here is our signable area. It is approximately 600 square feet that we have with which we can put the sign. And we have our sign here, which I made sure to provide Winter Holbin with all of, our, all of the town specs for signage ordinance. And as far as this sign goes, we are not requesting any waivers. Our waiver only pertains to the freestanding road sign, which I will discuss in a moment. But that's what this guy looks like. We have an alternate layout as well with darker colors instead. I think they both look pretty nice, and I, I, it's a little bit of a different branding from, as I understand, what is an inherited uh, graphical design on the existing stop-and-go locations. So I think it came out fairly nice. That is all. I'm now going to pick up all these plans. Any questions on any of this? Will you be, um, do you know if the gas station will be offering diesel? I do not know off the top of my head. Kevin, do you have? Yep. Yes, we will so have So if you are offering diesel, it stands to reason that tractor trailer trucks traveling Route 4, which there are a number of them that do that throughout the year, may want to pull in there to get gas, get diesel. And I guess my concern would be if we're talking about a 53-foot tractor trailer having trouble getting in who knows he's going there and maybe has been there before, somebody who's never been there with a tractor trailer could pull in and what? Have a difficult time navigating <coughs> the area? Is there a plan in place, I guess my question would be, to handle tractor trailers coming in to buy diesel? Uh, I don't think they'd make it under the canopy, right? 
Diesel is oftentimes outside, outside but the even if it's under, canopies would need to be high enough for... Yeah. Right. So I guess that's my question. Do you anticipate tractor trailer trucks pulling in to buy diesel? I, well, I, I don't know for Mr. Patel's intent for whether or not we... Sure, then by all means. So uh, my name is Kevin Patel, living in Dover. And uh, I wanted to answer the question. Sure. So the thing is, uh, not majority of gas station is able to, like, just for the example, uh, Cumberland Farm in Elliott has diesel, but like tractor trailer can get in. Not even boat behind your truck. If you have a boat behind your truck, they they can't even pull in into that uh, gas station. They all get gas at my like diesel at my location, so I kind of know what their have trouble is. They can't get in because if you know, like, you go usually on that beach road and then try to get it in, mm -hmm. it's not possible over there. So, like, majority of gas station, if they provide diesel, it doesn't mean, like, biggest tractor trailer can get in. Sometime it's just impossible because the way 55 mile an hour, like, even though no matter how much I try, it, like 53 feet trailer they will never try to pull in and like uh, my current location height is sufficient to get trailer in but they won't try for the smaller gas station to get in and even though we begin we're making it bigger like that right now if can fit in then like they usually don't try because they know how much room they need to turn around yeah okay Mr. Patel yes before you go too far, sure. related to that question, yep. are you having, you're just having, are you going to have any area there that, um, my daddy was long haul truckers, so you can blame him for me asking this question. Yeah. Is there any place there that tractor trailers are going to be able to park for their down hours that they're required by law to do when they're driving? Or uh, no? We are not making it like a truck stop. Okay. It's just going to be regular gas station. We are keeping diesel for the regular people driving over their road. But we are not trying to serve like a gas, uh, truck stop, so okay, no, that was, yeah, that was my none of the gas, none of the trucks are going to park overnight over there. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Oh. I would actually like to offer one quick uh, going off of what Kevin just said. I actually wasn't personally aware that we did in fact have room under the canopy for <laughs> trucks of that size. With that in mind, all of the vehicle tracking on our vehicle tracking sheet avoids the canopy. If we have sufficient clearance, any of our pre any of my previous concerns about a WB67 53-foot trailer truck not being able to navigate the site are significantly alleviated if you have room to go under the canopy, which it sounds like we do. Mm -hmm. So that's my mistake. I, I can amend those vehicle tracking sheets if we want to, but it would it, you'd be significantly uh, more able to navigate the site with that addition, even even in a WB67 truck with a 53 foot trailer. So your tracking sheets that you have up there are designed with the intent of the tractor trailer staying completely away from the canopy and not even. Yes, they are, the and you can. Oh. It's it's pretty visible there. It's it's a little more apparent uh, when it's not when you're not staring across the room to a big sheet of paper, but. There are two lines basically following each vehicle <coughs> showing the extent of where the wheels will go and the extent of where the trailer will go. <coughs> I went to great lengths to make sure that it was navigable without having a WB67 go under the canopy. With that allowance, it's decently navigable, I would say. That's all I have to add on that matter. Thank you. Okay. I have a question on your sheet one down the side here. Yep. Behind the trees, mm -hmm. is that supposed to be a fence that's installed in there? Yeah, I believe we had discussed at the previous meeting that they were there was some preference for a screening of, or a fence of some sort can going the, in there as can well. Can yeah. be added as to height and all that? There's no note on here stating. Um, let's see. Here. Yeah, I can find. I want to say there's a call out on one of these sheets <laughs> with reference to. I didn't find it. Shows it there. What does it call out exactly? Where is that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Yeah. 
but it's yeah. not labeled. Oh, okay. I remember. I, I remember what I was thinking of now. So we actually have a detail for the stockade fence that we put around the dumpster. I do have to be straightforward. We have not yet spec'd out exactly what we would want for a fence for that screening. If if the board has suggestions for what you prefer to see for any sort of a fence for screening where it's directly abutting a residential home meant to screen it from a commercial business, we would very much like to incorporate those suggestions. I think we brought that up during the site walk is that we were looking for a fence that would prohibit headlights from going through the residence about, uh, about the property. Yeah, but if there were, the, if I more so meant like specs beyond that, as far as like material height, any 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 sort of specification that we can get, we're happy to incorporate. But that's my mistake. I don't have that spec for you yet. If I remember correctly, and please <coughs> correct me if I am wrong, but. We talked about when the cars are parked in the parking spots that face that residence, that there would be something in front of those parking spots that would stop the headlights from going particularly at the residence. But um, my personal opinion is, even if that's true, I'm thinking off the top of my head that a six-foot tall fence would be something I would like to see to prevent that residence from getting headlights blinding into the windows. Sure. That's We're my official opinion. I think that sounds fine. So that would be for the one running along the property line. Right. We'd want that to be six feet. Okay. I, th I think it's only one side that there's a residence. One side. Yes. It is, yeah. 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 So I, I don't think, because I'm not a huge fan of fences. Um, I appreciate and understand the need for it to protect the neighbors from the, uh, the headlights turning in there. So I think, in my opinion, that, you know, I would just look for fencing to protect that neighbor from the headlight glare. Sure. Not necessarily around the whole property. Correct. And, yep. and that it be solid. So yes. that it absolutely stops uh, infiltration of light. Okay. Since we're talking about that, the same thing came up. I think it was brought up by somebody in the audience at the time. But the parking spots that face Route 4 would be shining directly across the street into the residence there. Yeah, Correct. If you're going to speak, you're going to come up to the mic. I guess. I guess my question on that would be, what's the distance between that those parking spots in the house, and are the lumens of the headlights enough to actually penetrate that building? You know, if you use, I think, I think a fence along the front of the, the front, the front of the property would not be. I don't think a fence was talked about at the time. It was like <coughs> no, it was more like a berm. A right. berm. Just, just something right. to stop the light from going. They discussed a vegetative barrier, basically. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what was talked about. Yeah, because I, I don't, I mean, I don't know the distance from there to the house across the street, but, you know, and then the lumens of a, of a headlight, do they carry that far? I don't, I don't know. It's, a, you know, that would be my question. If, if Is it a moot point to... Talk about a fence there if the headlights don't no. carry all the way across. I don't think the we're suggesting a fence. Anyways. It's just something to yeah, block. Yeah, I think the, the fence headlight. was only on that one side. The fence was just on the one side. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I may be wrong. If I remember correctly, uh, as per the uh, we didn't put over there because as per the ordinance, we are not required to put fence over there. But as as he said, like uh, we were at the sidewalk and he had a question about like uh, getting glass into neighborhood neighbor people. So we. Are considering to put fence over there, but as per the ordinance, we were not required at that time when they made a plan, so we did not change anything. But yes, definitely, even I want fence because I don't want to bother neighbors to get any kind of like a traffic traffic for their uh, quiet hours or anything. So we are putting fence for the front side where the Route Four is. Uh, we talk about it at the beginning at the first meeting also that we are putting a little high. Uh, stone wall at the front just to make I we don't want to ruin appearance of the building either by putting fence at the front but we will we are also planning like uh, at the first uh, drawing if you see it uh, we have like a little uh, small stone wall at the front to avoid that glass goes to the across the route 4 it's it's long enough distance between the our, our prod to the route 4 across the street house but still we are putting stone wall over there just for the better look and better appearance and fence is not a good idea for the front because it's just going to ruin the whole appearance of the building plus you can't get in uh, like when you're going out you can't see if somebody's going on the road if you put fence over there I, I think I think you know from my standpoint um, 
I would be satisfied with a, um, a line of sight, some some type of line of sight. And if you you know if your engineer could say it's 250 feet away from that parking spot, the the average you know distance of a headlight is 75 feet. Then I think I think it's a moot point, and I, I think that that's probably what we would find is that the the distance of the headlight across that you know we were just kind of just roughly estimating how far away the closest house is from that because I I definitely don't want to see a, a fence out in front of the store either. There's, um, there's and I don't also going to be an island and a turning lane built on Route Four, so that, that's also going to help protect. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I, I think that's my opinion. Is that I, you know, if if you could uh, just show us some data to say, you know, what's the average distance of a headlight, and um, you know how far away is the nearest house in that direction? Because we could be talking about nothing. So I don't have an immediate answer for how far the nearest house would be, but I mean, probably got probably got like a good like 150 feet at least. I. It, Probably more, if I'm guessing. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to get that for you. Um, I don't. I actually don't know off the top of my head if what the what the typical distance is for headlights. You have any there? That's fine. I mean, it just makes sense yeah. to me that you know, let's find out if it's potentially a problem before we <laughs> recommend a solution to a problem sure. that may not exist. If right. I may, it's 150 to 200 feet for a normal headlight. Okay. High beams are different, of course. I Dr. Googled it. No. I was visiting in the Dr. No. Google. And it says, I, I went with high beam because obviously that's going to be a bigger concern. So, uh, high beam headlights, they illuminate the road surface up to 350 to 400 feet in front of you, which is twice the distance as low beams. So, 150 to 200 for low beams and 350 to 400 and for high. I think we need to, uh, to sort this out. Um, one of the abutters who is directly across the street was the first one to speak mm -hmm. at uh, at the public hearing and uh, and I just think that you know uh, we need to understand uh, those those types of metrics so that we can yeah uh, right. and there's also going to be some bushes it looks like right next to those parking spots as well yeah yeah, right, here. yeah. right but so I know that there's gaps in between them but like he said with the rock wall as you know that that should be well thin enough do we have any preference for height on the stone wall I know that I mean that's one. that's all relative to the average height of cars I guess yeah I mean yeah. Find the guy with the highest truck in town. Cars and hey, <laughs> my Jeep's right. about three feet high. I'm, I'm, I'm parked out in the parking lot. Just saying. I, I think a reasonable expectation would be um, probably around 24 to 30 inches. Yeah, may, maybe 36 inches. You know, three feet off the ground. It'd probably be most headlights for a, a car. Trucks clearly might be higher. But I also know, you know, I, I understand you're doing the best you can to accommodate all these things and, and that there are places that don't meet these standards as they are. Cumbies in Berwick for one, you back into a parking space and you're heading right across the street or at the gas station. I get that. Um, but a good faith effort, I think, to put some kind of facade up in front of the parking spot, plus your bushes, um, for me, is, an, is a reasonable starting point. And I, that I think that's a very reasonable request, and I think we would definitely provide that stone wall for you. Can I interject one more thing? Yep. Retaining walls of four, if you do any sort of reten retention wall versus a, just a basic stone wall. Oh, that's all flat out front, right? Yeah, that's, that's okay. flat. Never mind then. Yeah, all good. I was going to tell you, don't do it without a permit, but you can do a regular <laughs> stone wall without a permit. Yeah. <laughs> so is there a dip between... Um, the gas station and the road, uh, a swale there. There's there's already up. a naturally occurring swale, and it will be slightly modified, at least for drainage. Yeah, for drainage purposes, there's already a swale that sort of runs like approximately along here or so. Um, there's like just to give you an idea of the middle of it. There's like a culvert, approximately where this dot is. It's visible on a different sheet. I can mm -hmm. flip to it if you'd like, but. We have. That's where the existing road is right now. The road cut and everything. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's a swale around here, yep. and we have a small pond that's like sort of right in this sort that sort of wraps around this corner as well. But 
So th yes, there is a dip to answer your okay. question. If not, two in depending on what spot you're looking at. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I guess the next thing would be to talk about your signage for the waiver. Um, Hannah wrote a nice memo, and in that memo, it says uh, the planning board may not grant a waiver for performance standards unless specifically authorized by the land use ordinance. A signed permit may be on may only be issued by the code enforcement officer that complies with the land use ordinance. So it kind of uh, has to be an external that sign. And I understand. Yeah, yeah. We, we we figured might as well request yeah. it, but now I understand. We have we consistently and continuously amend land use ordinances. Um, it's always a possibility to voice your opinions. And I believe and Mr. Patel already has, in fact. Okay. It, I think, I believe he had There's sent an letter. email to, I don't know if it was yeah. either of these two, but I know at least Terry okay. got an email from him when this had come up, when we wrote the waiver saying, hey, business owner in Berwick, yeah. I personally would like it if we could have, you know, illuminated signs for changing gas prices particularly. Okay. But I understand yeah. we, you know, we are seeking that waiver and it was, it was already made clear to us, at least by Terry, that, you know, definitely not certain when, when we were asking for it that we would get it. So that's okay. fine. We understand. Right. Any other questions? Concerns? Um, I know this has been quite a uh, journey on this, but um, with a lot of public um, input, we seen as a board that a uh, second public hearing for this would be a good thing. Um, is that correct? I think so. And okay. if needed, I'd make a motion that we schedule another public hearing if we need to do that. Yes. Okay. Second that motion. Okay. Further discussion? Nope. All in favor? All right. And that will be the next meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. I believe that's what she said, yes. Yeah. Date I had had previously floated was April 18th. I'm not sure if that's the next meeting, but that was what we had. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, April okay, 18th. so it's not going to be the next meeting. It'll be the one after that. All right. Well, that would make more sense because that means I don't have to do all the notices tomorrow. Okay. Good. Okay. So the 18th, 18th of April. Um, just to follow up on something that was mentioned the first time around and I'm I can't remember if it was explained or given an answer to or not but was there um, any looking into a second entrance was that a problem that so I have go? our traffic engineer and Diane. you're off <laughs> I, have, I have my traffic engineer Diane Morabito here she is extremely knowledgeable on the subject Perfect. and did all of our traffic studies Diane take it away <laughs> So this is a mobility corridor for DOT and it has higher standards and it has, it's 55 miles an hour. So because of that, there's a, I think 525 foot spacing that you're required to have between driveways. So there's no way we could fit a second one. Plus it's a mobility corridor, so they prefer just one entrance anyway. Can you define mobility corridor? It is a road that has been classified by DOT as mobility where they want to keep the speeds high. It's roads basically connecting long stretches of main and rural areas that have fairly high speed limits that they want to keep high so that people can get from one part of Maine to another in a reasonable time frame versus having to stop you know every 50 feet for somebody turning into or out of a driveway mm -hmm. um, plus it's also for safety reasons in that every curb cut is a conflict um, point so these were defined a whole bunch of years ago, and they have much higher standards. So that's what Route 4 in this area is. Is there any um, consideration given when curb cuts are added for housing or new roads or anything to lower a speed limit, and who makes that decision? <laughs> um, that is a DOT decision. The town can always request DOT to do a speed zone study. And DOT has always, in the past, looked at speeds in terms of the 85th percentile, which is the speed that 85% of the traffic travels at or below. 
they are starting to think differently about that in areas where there's a lot of speeding. Um, but typically what has to happen is you need a corridor pretty developed with a lot of curb cuts to justify a reduction in speed. It needs to be more densely developed and than it is now. You know, it's pretty rural out there and built for higher standards. I guess yes. the, concern, the concern I have is we've had some, a lot of development in that area with the advent of uh, both the abutting businesses to this project as well as the ATM <coughs> across the street. And that has increased people slowing down, turning in, turning out, and there have been some horrific wrecks. Right. And that's why they wanted to limit curb, that's why they want to limit curb cuts because of that action of turning in and turning out of drives and how dangerous it can be. Um, they, as you know, they have done that Route 4 corridor study mm -hmm. to look at ways to make this area safe. And the traffic permit, the draft permit that's been issued for this project requires turn lanes, right and left turn. It also requires this project to build turn lanes at Blackberry Hill Road to make sure that those turns are safe. Um, it just being a realist and, and living and commuting on yeah, the I mean, road. Yeah, I mean, it's something the, the, the town posted, can... The posted speed limit's 55. People are doing 65. Mm -hmm. and, it, and when you pull out, it, it, you see people pulling out of kind farms or, or out of the, uh, the ATM. I, it, it's going to be a shame to open a business and have people get... Oh, absolutely. Interacts right in front of your business. Right. That, if that business. I would... <laughs> You know, I think the town has that concern. I think a legitimate time to ask that of DOT would be after the development goes in because you have a better chance of finding that the speeds have been slowed down by that curb cut. At, at what cost, though? You, you know what I mean? I, what's it, how many people well, do we have Because I think if, if you ask them to, to, if to, you ask the them to do a speed zone study now, I don't think they'd find that there's a justification for lowering it. I think they'd be more likely to find a reason after the site is developed. Um, but so certainly the town can ask. I mean, as part of that speed study, um, I don't know if Goral Palmer looked at reducing the speed. They did that study. They did not. Yeah, they it found just the looked, average was 58 miles an hour mm -hmm. at the 85%. Which is typical yeah. that you three or four or five miles over posted. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the state will not allow another entrance for safety considerations. Correct. Okay. Yes. Can I, and, can to I, keep, and to maintain speeds. It's to maintain mobility because it's a mobility corridor. Could I ask for just a little bit of clarification? I believe you said at 55 miles an hour, there was like 550 something feet required in between driveways? 525? I okay. think it's 525. So is that on the same property or is that from any curb cut to any curb cut? Any curb cut to any curb cut. And do you know what it would be if it was 45 miles an hour, what that number would be? Um, I believe it's something like 350. Is that within the realm of possibilities, uh, hypo hypothetically, if yeah. it was? I, I mean, this project was willing to go with a single curb cut. A single curb cut is safer you know, versus two. I'm not sure why you would want a second the, the curb cut. The state would have to lower the speed Sure. No, I get it. We would have to request yeah. that. Yeah. They would well, have to do we, it. It's already been requested. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. they keep denying it, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a single curb cut Good. is always safer. It, it's a second. It's fewer curb conflict points yeah. than yeah. you would have with two curb cuts. Yep. Forgive me. I mean, I'm just asking the questions that I think a lot of people would want to know. Mm -hmm. So if I get to ask them for them, then they won't come it yelling is, at you it later. Is in traffic study. <laughs> yeah. If you look in here, it gives you all that information. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But I don't know if it's out of the realm either that we request the flashing yellow lights be put at Pond Road and Blackberry Hill Road so people slow down regardless of whether it's 55 or not. Right. You need a flashing either beacon. Either selectman, yeah. select board issue, or the... A flashing yellow beacon? Yeah. Yeah, no. that can only be put in a, at a location that's high crash, technically. And I don't believe... Well, I don't believe Blackberry Hill Road is a high crash location. I mean, you may have had a bad crash, but it needs to have eight or more crashes over three years and a higher than expected rate. And I can tell you what it is. Yeah, I think one, one of the issues that um, that those of us who are travel on that road a lot uh, see at, that we can quantify the accidents and we can quantify the deaths and the injuries and that sort of thing. We can't quantify the near misses. And uh, we, they're all anecdotal. 
So uh, if there was nothing that you had to call, you know, a police, ambulance, fire for, then um, then it's it's not something that we can quantify. But uh, those of us who are on it know that it's pretty dangerous in that section. about this and they said the more people that complain the more action they will take that's good to know that's good information so, so uh, the this, more people that call the DOT or send a letter the better it will be so those of you here and those of you listening at home are pestering the DOT because the town can only do so much unfortunately and exactly. we don't like losing our our neighbors any more than anybody else wants to see them lost but mm -hmm. DOT is a machine Sucks, but it is what it is. Uh, this, this, you're very knowledgeable, and I appreciate you giving us information. Thank you for coming. Yes. Um, and this may be a question that is best for DOT and not for you, but with the turning lanes being added, which I think are great and very necessary if this project were to be approved, um, do you know or do you think that would influence DOT's decision on speed for a mobility corridor, being that we now have extra lanes to deal with, or do you think still 55 zooming by these cars waiting to turn? Yeah, I don't, like I said, I think the greatest likelihood of getting it reduced is after there's a curb cut there with a lot of traffic turning in and out, okay. after the convenience store goes in. I think just adding the turn lanes without a lot of traffic, utilizing them wouldn't really change things out there much but once you have a lot of traffic turning in and out it may it may make a difference okay curveball. I appreciate that can I throw you a curveball yeah so just to play out every potential oper you know, future opportunity here is there any intent on the applicants behalf if the speed limit is reduced to add a second entrance or exit if the or is the site set up so they could if they chose to? I believe we, with this, why this it's coming back. With one curb cut. I mean, I think Even when it came to me. Why you want a second curb yeah. Cut. I would want a second curb cut for the exact reason that was talked about earlier in that a tractor trailer would have would be able to make it, but it certainly sounds like it's more of a challenge than a, a breeze through. Um, to gain entrance to that gas station, and with the with the um, sale of diesel, you know, truckers who have never been through here before are going to pull in no matter what to see if they can get to a diesel pump. And when they find out they can't, um, is there an easy easy way for them to navigate <coughs> through and out again without six turns to to block um, business inside the establishment, but also um, any uh, entrance back onto the roadway. So I guess my opinion is a second curb cut would help with ins and outs of traffic generally. I, I think I think the opposite. I think that a second curb cut in, would potentially encourage that traffic, whereas, you know, I've, I've drove a tractor trailer for a long time, and, you know, I'm, I'm not pulling to a gas station like that to get diesel. Yeah. Not even maybe. Now but if they had a second outlet, maybe. If they had frontage to Blackberry Hill Road, then that could, might be a possibility. Mm -hmm. But the, so I think a second outlet you know. would encourage that type of traffic. And you know, has already stated that he's not he's not trying to attract that kind of traffic. Right. Mm -hmm. It'd be like an emergency stop, like if they're running out of fuel or something like that. Maybe. Realistically, most truckers know how far their trucks are going to. Well, you said you drove for a long time. Most truckers know how far they can make it, and they've got their 
tried and true truck stops that they go to. So yeah. I think the risk of a random 18-wheeler pulling in would be less yeah, I'm, than... I'm not saying it won't happen. But no, I no. It's, I don't know many truck drivers that will try to pull into that gas station. Yeah. No, it will just be smaller than what John Q. Publish may think it would be just because of the mentality of truckers. Sorry, Dad. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, you know, one of my issues on, on the not having the second entrance is that if we have some major accident in that entrance, even so that we have these two 11, 11 foot exit lanes now, so we're 38 feet instead of 24 feet, uh, that's all well and good, but if something happens there and there's a large truck blocking it, there's no emergency equipment that's getting into that station. If there was another entrance, then emergency equipment could get out. So that's that was yeah, I'm always my thinking yeah. that one in and one out is not um, is not ideal. Yeah. Well, but I'm thinking if the, if there's a crash at the entrance itself, they're probably going to be blocking emergency services. Will probably block the road and use the entire road anyway, and stop traffic. Right, but could not get, for instance, to the building if the building's right. on fire or something of that sort. Right. Uh, that ha that have to you know drag closes all the way across. This is out of our scope, though. We don't have control over whether they can have one or two curb cuts. Yeah, DOT was clear. Yep. I mean, it's yeah. one. I, I requested that, and I got shot down very fast. <laughs> very fast. <laughs> and like I said, from a traffic perspective, and the reason for those rules is it is much safer. It's one less conflict point. <coughs> you know, somebody has their blinker on, and somebody thinks they're turning into that first drive, and they go to pull out, but they're really turning into the second drive. I mean, there, there are a lot of issues when you have two drives versus a single drive. Well, especially drive. with the, the design of the islands, too, for the turning lanes. Exactly. Then you'd have to have two entrances and two exits right, on Right, you'd need to extend that left yeah. turn lane. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. No, I'm glad we had the discussion <laughs> so that people understand yep. both sides. Okay. Thank you. All right. No new business. Second public comment. But are you done? I had one oh, small, okay. small piece to add. Sorry, coming back. <laughs> <laughs> business. Um, during our scoping meeting with the DOT and with Goral Palmer present, they actually were the ones that dictated our where we put our curb cut, where our driveway is. I know someone had asked, is it set up for a second curb cut? That was me. I was asking if the site was set up so you could add a second it curb cut. It is absolutely not. And we cannot, we, this is not a good, to be frank with you, this is not our preferred location for the driveway. That like, as it is currently, you come straight in, and again, this is dictated by DOT. You come in, and you have to go around the pumps to even get to the parking spaces. We wanted it another way. This is how it ended up. It wound up there in order to provide the storage lengths that we want for the left turn lanes and the right turn lanes and to make everything fit between Blackberry Hill Road and the site drive and to give rooms for tapers and transitions. So, I mean, that's why it wound up there, is it mm -hmm. moved a little bit farther north to get greater distance from Blackberry Hill and to fit your transitions in between your lanes. Thank you. That's, that's all I had for that, for that <laughs> matter. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Diane. Yeah. All right, thank you. That's all? Yep. All right. All right. No new business. Uh, second public comment. Uh, not on this. No, no, you can't no. discuss this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can we public bring hearing. up an issue with the applicant here related to materials we received today, or is this not the appropriate? Not the appropriate time. We we will discuss that at the public hearing. At the public hearing, everything yep. will be discussed at yep. the public hearing. That's why we're having a second public yep. hearing. Yep. Is so okay. yep, we can discuss all these new new things. All right. Okay. Oh, is you good now? Yep. <laughs> I am sorry. I have had to say I just want to yeah. go. I, you have no idea. I just want to go bury myself in a hole somewhere. Um, so, of course, the LUO amendments. Um, we want to keep them on the agenda to begin with. So mm -hmm. the usual spiel for the people present and people at home, always taking suggestions, recommendations. We do request that possible you cite what ordinance you um, are referring to when you suggest updates, but send them to planning at berwickmain.org or you can send them to me, code at berwickmain.org. 
Now, having been said, I just want to give you guys a heads up. A few things will be coming your way. Um, probably not until after the public hearing for this because I have, I've been tasked with doing some typing and a million other things. But uh, just a, a little few things that have come up. Uh, family burial grounds. That was a fun, a fun little adventure this week. Yeah, we have ordinances for cemeteries, but the state handles family burial grounds, but we're feeling like we should reference that in our ordinance, so we'll just be adding that in. Um, there, I've been asked by the Board of Appeals to add a definition of a butters that specifies the distance from the parent parcel to our ordinance, so it's clear to everybody what a butters distances are. So I'm going to check a few places. Excuse me. And check a few places and make sure that uh, we don't have any discrepancies. Um, there is a. Um, okay, there's a one discontinued road that has been the subject of conversation off and on for many years here in town and after conversation with the town attorney. Um, he has made some suggestions on how we'd like to see our, the issue is access to this discontinued road that is not wide enough um, to be brought up to town standards. But there's a lot of land on there that's been changing hands. Um, the people that own this land can't really do anything with it because it can't be brought up to town standards. So the town attorney told me how to handle that to allow those property owners to have some right of accessibility to their properties and utilize those. So I'll be drafting that the way he asked. Is, is that a private road? Or yeah, it? yeah, it's a private road. So it's, wouldn't it be incumbent upon the landowners to enter into an MOU with their butters to maintain that road? Why the, is the town even involved? The, because if you read, and if you want to make note of this, this you can familiarize yourselves with this original section. It's uh, 7.21, 7 um, the access to properties. So the town ordinance, you're allowed to put two properties on an undeveloped road. Once you add the third, it has to be brought up to town standards. So this very lengthy discontinued road cannot have additional houses on it, except we have a clause that the town attorney said definitely needs to be reworked or clarified that says you can only have a, another dwelling if it's your kid and um, it has to be deed, you know, in the deed. And the town attorney suggests that we remove the child part and you know and make it just deed restricted so that these people can utilize their land that they've purchased that because they're not able to get what we you know the property owners that are adjacent to that road don't want to sell off any of their land which is perfectly within their rights but thus prevents that road from ever being brought up to town standards so basically it just is uh almost like that sounds like a great, and, and, and not to play devil's advocate, but we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the growth of the town. That, that sounds like a existing way to limit growth in those areas. So why would we, because it's why exact, would we make it easier? Because it's, it's borderline, uh, it's borderline spot zoning, which is illegal. It doesn't specify that particular one road, but since there is only one road in the entirety of town that is absolutely prohibited from being able to be brought up to town standards. It's it's almost like spot zoning. So we're trying to waive that a little bit. Um, but again, I'm just being asked to write it up, and it's going to be up to you guys, the select board and the town voters, to determine what you guys want to do with it. I'm just giving you a warning so you guys can kind of read ahead on, on what you're looking at for potential things that are being uh, added. And then one more uh, thing that is uh, that uh, James is currently working on that uh, I don't think I have to deal with, but you guys will be seeing is the addition of deputy code enforcement officer to our land use ordinance. So that way, you know, in the future, if you guys choose, you can have a code officer and a deputy code officer. Every town should have more than one code enforcement officer because it prevents conflict of interests. So let's just say that, you know, that Don and his wife set divorce and him and I run away together. <laughs> Sorry, Don. Okay. I only I'm only using you because I know your wife and she's yeah. she she won't take offense. Um, 
because she'll know I'm joking, but uh, then if Dawn ever did anything, pull a permit, well, I have a conflict of interest there. Yeah. So your option mm -hmm. would be to do what? So if you're by having a second person that's in an enforcement position as a deputy code enforcement officer, it allows a disinterested party. So it prevents Didn't that. we have an MOU with South Berwick for those instances? I thought we did. Uh, I don't believe there's anything in place at all. Okay. And um, it's definitely did. way cheaper I for the town. It's way cheaper for the town if whomever is here. If we don't have a code enforcement officer, we use them as an interim. Um, yes. I, gotcha. I don't think it goes back and forth. Cause there, they are an interim. Um, okay. or, but I believe that contract expired as well. Because, it, right. Yeah. So I don't. I just see, and, and I'm, again, oh, no. devil's advocate, it, it would almost seem more financially advantageous to the town if we leveraged our relationship with our neighbor to fill in on the, for these onesies, twosies, as opposed to hiring somebody new and having the citizens as, take as on somebody, that tax burden. Do you know well, there wouldn't be somebody. Hired? Yeah, first of all, I wish it was somebody new being hired, but that is absolutely not the case. Look, I don't, I don't want to spill the beans, but Harry's getting certified as a code enforcement officer. Gotcha. Right now, she's not allowed to be deputized to take over these situations that I might have a conflict of interest on. But in, but in all reality, if she is pursuing extra qualifications to fulfill that role, we would, I would hope she would want to be compensated for that. And, it, and the end result is that is a burden on the taxpayers. Right, but either way, it'd be a burden. Whether we hire an other town, it would probably cost more to it, hire the other as town. As somebody who has be been the person that's been hired to cover other towns, uh, to include Lebanon, uh, Old Orchard, I've covered North Berwick mm -hmm. while working for other municipalities. It is significantly more expensive because then, you know, it's they give them kind of a walk away price. All right, that's mm -hmm. the job that that's the price we give a job we don't want to do. It's the walk away price. So they're covering when we're when we're hiring somebody. Typically, we're covering not only their wages and their share, you know, their actual full daily cost, mm -hmm. usually plus a little extra to the uh, agency that we're that we're mm -hmm. taking from. So if Terry's certified she's already working here she's getting paid that just mm -hmm. means she can take on more work hopefully she can I think that you know yeah. Terry got a little bump for you yeah. know an extra certification would make sense because right. Right. one of the other challenges is not just the cost associated to it but you know how available are they I mean if everybody's busy right I think right. we're gonna see some slowdown coming but you know the last couple of years who has extra time to cover another town Right. And every, you know, I covered North Berwick, um, unfortunately, when, when Roger passed away. And it was, um, I mean, it, there's no mistaking, I still take homework, right? I don't, I don't do it as much, but I still take homework. But at that time, when I was working for Wells, I was covering North Berwick. And I was taking home a lot of work because just the travel from Wells to North Berwick doesn't seem like far, but then traveling all around North Berwick, wiping out all their inspections, I was losing half a day to a full day a week coming down to North Berwick from Wells, which is what, a 10 minute drive, 15 minute drive from my office there to their town office, but I was losing half a day to a full day. So that's why they get the walk away price because then they have to pay me over time to do my job that I'm actually there for. Yeah. But, you know, also in this, um, and I see both sides of this argument, uh, the fact is that every town has their own land use ordinances. Mm -hmm. So now you've got to be familiar with South Berwick, oh, North yeah. Berwick, Lebanon, you know, yeah, all, all those which are different. So, uh, you know, perhaps it's not a bad idea. Yeah. Fair point well made, Paul, because that was one of the more interesting pieces <laughs> of <laughs> coverage for other municipalities. Yeah, Hannah has As someone to deal who with covers it. a few municipalities. <laughs> <laughs> You've got me beat. They're all friends. very different. Every, every yeah. day is a new world, right? Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> Back. Right. I, think, yeah. I think it's a great idea. I think, yeah. you know, capitalize on the people we have. We have some great people yeah. in the office with us. and. Uh, Capitalize on them. And, I think you know. utilize maybe is better than capitalize. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it saves the town so people money, having someone in house versus out of the house, I mean, 
It's like hiring a part-time person or a full-time person. Yeah. It sometimes it's cheaper to hire two part-timers than it is for a full-timer. Yeah. Especially and when they cover benefits and all oh, that yeah, goodness. Sure. And sure. honestly, not for nothing, but when you're talking reciprocal coverage, and I'm going to reveal stuff about myself here to the board and to the public at home that I kind of mostly kept under my. <laughs> you guys kind of know some of it, but. Um, with those, with the coverage that I've done historically and that you typically do, it's like, oh, I'm going to be out having surgery for a week. Can you, you know, um, I am having some medical issues and I've had a couple of occasions where I have very unexpectedly been unavailable for a couple of days and that's not something that would typically work out with a reciprocal contract. Makes sense. So, and that could happen to anybody. Even when I retire from here and somebody takes the position, it could happen to them too. Or if you want to take a vacation. Yeah. Wait, yeah. what is yeah. that? What is that? Yeah. What, I don't, I'm, I'm not familiar with that word. There is such a word. thing. Yeah, I'm not there is familiar such a with thing. that word. <laughs> no vacation. But that's all I have at this point. We have okay. not received a whole lot of other mm -hmm. requests, but we're hoping the public will start sending in some more requests. Yes. Okay. Um, so next is informational items. Um, the one thing I have is next Thursday is the sewer district tour, and that's at 4.30 um, at the sewer district. I will not be there. Terry will be meeting you guys for that okay. one. Okay. Um, uh, Close pins are optional. <laughs> <laughs> actually, ironically. They say it doesn't smell. Last uh, time I was there, it was actually in the summer, and it smelt like lobster, which I don't understand. It didn't, like, stink. It didn't stink. It just smelled. Well, I mean, I don't like lobster, but it didn't, like, stink, stink. Yeah, it's the treats I feed my cat. Vix. You want Vix. It's nice. You want Vix under the nose. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Eat lobster treats. Okay. Any other informational items? I want to go home. There are no other items for consideration from the esteemed Burgess meeting room in the depths of the Berwick Town Hall. I'll make a motion that we adjourn. And I second that motion. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All right, good night. <laughs> good night, folks.